All right, folks, hello and welcome back to Online English Class. I hope you guys are doing well today. Today we're going to be working on the second part of uh, OTN 6, which analyzes the anticlimactic digression uh, that Marlowe offers to uh, us, the reader, uh, and also to uh, those who are listening to the story on the Nelly, the cruising yawl on the Thames, uh, that basically ruins uh, the story, that, uh, that undercuts the suspense uh, of the story and deconstructs the sort of linear narrative of the plot. We're going to be talking about why that happens and how that characterizes Kurtz uh, in this section of the narrative. Okay, before we do that, let's quickly run through the top of the week announcements here at the end of the week so that you can uh, keep the tasks that you should be doing uh, straight in your head. All right, so first of all, make sure that you are continuing your discussion grade procedure on a daily basis. Enough on that, you know what to do. Uh, aside from that, make sure you finish your uh, reading of part three over the course of the weekend and that you send me email, uh, uh, email reading check confirmation of that by next Monday. Uh, I should already have your OTNs two, three, and four uh, confirmation. Okay, aside from that, make sure that you are keeping up with your OTNs as we complete them in class and making sure that you are engaging in the drafting process for the quarter four essay. As always, or just to, to remind you once again, uh, we'll be talking more specifically uh, about those, um, uh, uh, about that drafting process later. Right now, uh, our, our, our attention is focused uh, pretty squarely on Heart of Darkness. Okay, so let's uh, turn our attention back to the text. All right, and look at the prompt uh, that is going to uh, organize uh, our work for the day. All right, so yesterday we looked at an SQ3R for this section of text, and essentially uh, we came to the conclusion that this uh, was a, a kind of break in the narrative structure, in the linear narrative thread, all right, uh, the, uh, of the yarn, all right, that Marlowe is kind of spinning, okay, metaphorically speaking. Uh, and typically a narrative, a plot, is meant to build uh, to a meaningful climax, all right? Uh, and that climax can be tragic, or it can be comic, right? It can be good, it can be it can be bad, it can be a kind of negotiation between opposites that reestablishes a balance, as we saw in some of the myths that we looked at earlier in the year. But regardless, right, it, for a narrative to ha kind of have a, a, a logic, a, 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 a cohesion that is satisfying, uh, to human beings, right? Uh, it, it, it should build to a climax that makes sense, all right? Uh, that bring together the conflicts, uh, that, 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 ri that, that raise the action to a kind of fever pitch, all right, uh, to, to its most intense portion, and then unravel and resolve, okay? So before we can get there, before we get all the way to the interstation and the questions, uh, uh, for example, is Kurtz going to be okay? What kind of man is Kurtz? Uh, uh, it, he, he's been called an exceptional man. Is, is he uh, truly exceptional? And is Marlowe going to find what he's, going, uh, what he's looking for with Kurtz? Are they going to work together and, and do anything significant uh, uh, to bear out and, and to offer evidence uh, of the benefits of this pilgrimage that Marlowe's been uh, 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 undertaking? For, for, for so long, right? Well, before he can even get there, right, he spills the beans on, on, on who Kurtz is and what Kurtz is like, okay? So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to analyze the significance of that use of anticlimax, right? So that's a narrative device. Why does Conrad allow Marlowe to ruin his story, all right? Uh, Conrad's the writer here, right? Why does Joseph Conrad allow Marlowe, this fictional narrator who is telling uh, uh, this sort of fictional experience that is meant to offer a kind of uh, symbolic pilgrimage, all right, that is reflective of the modern quest for meaning, what, why does he allow Marlowe to ruin the story? Why does he interrupt the frame narrative uh, and, and break up, diffuse the suspense in Kurtz's continued characterization. And what does that mean? What is revealed about Kurtz's character, okay? So the first thing we want to consider is the narrative structure. All right, so after the attack on the steamship, all right, everyone open up to page 107 uh, uh, or find the paragraph that says, here, give me some tobacco at the end of it, all right? It's after the section of text that we studied earlier in the week about the attack, all right, after the clearing of the fog uh, and the native attack on, on the steamship, okay? So Marlowe believes uh, or feels uh, in that moment after the attack, all right, after the death of the helmsman, that, that he's been robbed. Uh, of a kind of destiny in his life, okay, uh, robbed of a kind of belief uh, because he believes that Kurtz is dead, all right, uh, and this leads him 
uh, to speak directly, all right, to break the, the, the linear narrative, all right, to stop telling the story and start talking, okay, to the people on the ship with him. Here, give me some tobacco. Like, okay, he just needs to like take a break for a second, all right, and do some smoking. And then the naive narrator takes back over, right? Do you see this? Who's speaking in this paragraph? It's the naive narrator. This is a break in the frame. It's a break in the linear unfolding of the narrative. There was a pause of profound stillness and a match flared and Marlowe's lean face appeared, worn, hollow, with downward folds and dropped eyelids, with an aspect of concentrated attention as he took vigorous draws at his pipe. Okay, and then Marlowe, instead of picking back up where he left off, okay, instead of going as a linear narrative, what linear just means uh, it follows the pattern of a line, it moves uh, in a cohesive, coherent direction. Does that make sense? Okay, instead of picking up the narrative where he left off, instead of saying, and then after we, you know, buried the helmsman, we kept on steaming up and we arrived. Uh, at, at, at the interstation, we met the Harlequin. Instead of doing that, there is this digression, all right? Uh, there is this sort of break in the pattern, all right, uh, where Marlowe kind of goes AWOL for a second. Uh, he loses his composure, and he, uh, and he exposes Kurtz for the kind of man that he was, all right? So why does, does Conrad do that? Okay, well, first and foremost, the reason why he uses this break in the linear narrative, this anticlimax, is to mimic the inevitable disappointment of searching for moral order, all right, in an essentially morally chaotic world. Okay, so in the same way the narrative doesn't drive to a satisfactory climactic moment, unlike, say, the Inferno, all right, in which the pilgrim is exposed to deep and desperate kinds of darkness, all right, uh, in which he is exposed to very fearsome aspects that are true of him in his soul, that he, like Satan, is guilty of betraying his benefactor. That, that, that at that climactic moment, right, whenever he embraces Satan and he's closer than ever to all of his repressed fears and uh, all of his unconfessed sin, that there is this climactic turning in which the downward motion turns into upward motion. And by the end of the narrative, it becomes very clear that this process of repentance led uh, the pilgrim not only to a, uh, a more accurate understanding of his world uh, and, and of himself, but rather, all right, that that led to not only just an accurate understanding of it, but hope for the future, that there was redemption from those truths, okay? Instead of giving us that kind of satisfactory, meaningful, coherent uh, kind of climactic moment, the climax is ruined. It is disappointing, all right? Much in the same way that Marlowe's quest for moral coherency is ruined. It's disappointed, all right? The expectations of the reader are inverted, all right? Uh, uh, the reader uh, of any kind of narrative, okay, so all the TV shows you watch on a daily basis, right? The documentaries that you watch, uh, if you're watching uh, uh, some documentaries right now, the, Mi the Michael Jordan documentaries out there, so it's supposed to be su super good, all right? I want to start watching it, okay? Uh, 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 the, the TV shows you like, the movies that you see, right? They all follow a very similar kind of narrative pattern, okay? Even people who tell good stories that make you laugh uh, uh, just around a campfire or around the dinner table, they typically follow this kind of narrative arc in which you start with some introductory information, whether brief or long, and then there's some kind of conflict, some kind of problem. Uh, the problem might be serious or comic, and then it rises to a kind of head, right, where things come together, and there's some decisive moment that unfolds, and then that uh, the, 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 there's there's either a laugh that follows or tears and a tragedy that follow. Okay, but some kind of coherent linear plot that is expected by the listener or the reader. And here Conrad denies the reader that expected, anticipated coherency, mimicking the incoherency of Marlowe's pilgrimage. Marlowe's narrative, very much like his pilgrimage itself, is incoherent in its telling, 
and in its meaning, okay? So Marlowe's work, steaming up the river to Kurtz, like his work, retelling the narrative coherently, like Conrad's work as a novelist, all right? So Marlowe's work as storyteller, Marlowe's work as uh, steamship captain, Marlowe's work as pilgrim, like our work as reader, are all brought to this sort of ironic and anticlimactic end as the meaning we hoped to find, the meaning that we, uh, that we expected or anticipated to find, does not exist. It isn't given to us, okay? So this anticlimax, this anticlimax is meant to mimic or imitate or connote uh, the, the, the kind of si the, the significance or imitate the, the significance of what Marlowe is being confronted with uh, uh, with Kurtz, okay, the meaning of his pilgrimage as a whole, okay? So what does he say Kurtz is like, right? How does he characterize Kurtz? Well, essentially, Kurtz is not the moral paragon that Marlowe expected him to be. He's not a kind of messianic figure or a modern Christ figure that Marlowe expected him to be, but rather Kurtz becomes a kind of incarnation of the, quote, inner truth, all right? This, that inner truth that, that Marlowe says earlier was hidden, luckily, luckily, a devastating line from the novel, right? Uh, the, Kurtz becomes this incarnation of an inner truth that moral idealism and a morally coherent life are hollow attempts to follow rules. All right, track with me here. Hollow attempts to follow rules, to, to create rules that don't exist and do not reflect reality. Okay? So it'd be like if, there, uh, if you thought that there was a rule against uh, yeah, I don't know, like, uh, you, you cannot scratch an itch, uh, or else, right, your immortal soul will be destroyed. So you live your life in agony, desiring to scratch your head because, oh, it, it is itching so devastatingly terribly, right? But there is no rule against scratching your head. Go ahead, enjoy. It's fine. You can find relief for that desire. It is okay. Okay. Uh, in other words, Kurtz becomes this incarnation that Marlowe and all human endeavors to understand some kind of transcendent moral structure, so to, to develop, to discover, to create some kind of uh, moral structure are hollow. They're rules that don't exist and rules that cannot be made, morality at its best is based on misunderstandings that dissolve into relativism, as one might be quote-unquote right uh, uh, in one circumstance or on one day or in, in one uh, historical milieu, but they might be wrong in another, okay? So in other words, it's not actually morally right or morally wrong, it's just expedient in one context and inexpedient in another. It might be nice in one context and not nice in another. It's not an actually a question of morality, rather simply a sentimental pretense. Or at worst, morality, seem, uh, Marlowe seems to be discovering uh, through his in engagement with Curse, is, is at worst a fraudulent disguise of baser desires for power and pleasure, okay? So, in other words, very much like the angelic white accountants uh, uh, consumed and surrounded by death, decay, and injustice, right? Uh, he believes himself to be a man with backbone, a man with work ethic, uh, a, a man who is doing his part to spread civilization, but in reality, he is there for a paycheck. He is there for baser desires toward power and pleasure. Uh, and when we persuade ourselves that what we're doing is right and not just expedient, we're simply just engaging in the same kind of fraud uh, that the Belgian Congo company is engaging with on a large scale in the Congo. Okay, so 
In other words, Kurtz becomes this incarnation of the fact that, that there is no such thing as morality, all right? But rather, okay, there is simply one law, one ethic, okay? Kurtz is stripped of all of his moral pretenses, okay? So notice the description of one, on, on 108. Kurtz seems to be, all right, uh, Marlowe says, uh, uh, he, he's described as uh, an individual, a specimen, uh, who has been patted on the head by the wilderness, and behold, he was bald, like a like a uh, like a cue ball, okay, like a ball, like an ivory ball. It had caressed him, okay. That that word is sort of disturbingly uh, sexual in its nature. It had caressed him, and lo, he had withered. It had taken him, loved him embraced him, got into his veins, consumed his flesh, and sealed his soul to its own by the inconceivable ceremonies of some devilish initiation. He was its spoiled and pampered favorite. Okay, so in other words, all right, uh, it, 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 Kurtz's symbolic baldness, the fact that he has gone into the Congo and lost all of his hair, the fact that he is uh, described as this massive, hairless, ivory ball of a man, all right, it, it is indicative of the ways in which Kurtz's uh, uh, experience in the Congo, uh, far afield from uh, trying to illuminate the savagery with the light of the civil, with, with light of civilization, with light of humanitarianism, with light of, of moral idealism, all right, Kurtz simply embraces the reality uh, that the world is governed by only one law. Okay, he's stripped of his moral pretenses, just as he, okay, symbolically uh, as he is uh, sort of uh, uh, bald, right? Uh, he has no, uh, he, he's stripped of all kind of European or moral pretenses, and he becomes the man that he is most essentially, right? One who seeks power and pleasure at the expense of the weak. Uh, let me let me let, let me say that again. I'm going to try to say it exactly as I just said it. Okay, he becomes he's stripped of his moral pretenses, and he becomes the man that he is most essentially, all right? The man that he is truly in his heart. The man that uh, uh, not not the man that he makes himself, but the man that he is, uh, in, in essence, is one who seeks power and pleasure at the expense of the weak in constant competition with all things for survival. Okay? In, in this way, he embraces the ethic of the food chain, right? So just as every virus, every, every organism in, in, uh, uh, in the world instinctively seeks after survival to continue living and that's and that process is essentially amoral for all living things right lions don't have to apologize for eating uh, 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 antelope right even the baby ones the cute ones that you watch on natural Ge Ge geographic and the lions are uh, chasing them down you're like not that one that one's cute right get one of the old ones well they eat those too right? Uh, just in the same way that they're not held accountable morally uh, for their exploitation, uh, for their killing and consumption of that antelope, much in the same way human beings who are simply a, 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 a little more sophisticated, a, a little more complex organism, uh, seeks after survival amorally, okay? Finding their place on a kind of food chain. Okay, in which those that are weaker than them, whether they be weaker species or weaker individuals of the hu uh, 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 weaker humans, right? That, that those individuals are used ultimately as tools uh, to maintain their access to power and pleasure, whatever that pleasure may be, whatever position of power that might be. Okay, uh, this attitude is evident. In, uh, in, in Kurtz's uh, sort of obsessive, uh, uh, greedy my statements, right? Uh, uh, Marlowe says when he finally did get to talk with Kurtz, Kurtz was obsessed with talking about the things that he owned, 
right? My ivory, my intended, the woman that he's going to marry back in Belgium. My ivory, he repeats, my station, my river, my everything belong to him, okay? In other words, uh, Kurtz has embraced this kind of ethic of ownership, control, power, dominion, the ethic of the food chain, the ethic of survival of the strong, okay? And instead of being embarrassed by that, instead of equivocating about that, instead of being dishonest in his pursuit of that ethic, he is honest. He simply confesses it aloud, right? Uh, this is also evident in, in, in the significance or, or, or the kind of connotations of Marlowe's description of the way that Kurtz changes while he's in the Congo, right? Before Kurtz went in the Congo, he was painting, paint, uh, before he was immersed in the inner station and stayed there and the jungle sort of got into his veins and he recognized the reality of the world that he lived in, the morally chaotic uh, uh, amoral environment than he inhabited, right? He's painting paintings uh, of uh, women holding uh, the, the sacred fire up into the darkness, uh, at, well, blindfolded, you know, courageously spreading the light of Western civilization. Uh, he's writing essays uh, about uh, uh, the, the suppression of savage customs, right? But to illustrate the simplicity, okay, uh, the, the stripping bear of Kurtz, uh, of the man when confronted with the reality of the world that he lives in, right? Uh, this whole long essay of compressed, eloquent writing, okay, uh, indicative of all that is best, all that is valued in Western civilization, right? Uh, these humanitarian concepts uh, articulated uh, by an educated man in a well-structured, reasonable essay. At the end of it is scrawled, all right, in, in, in sort of broken uh, penmanship, okay, uh, uh, like a flash of lightning, lightning, okay, illuminating an otherwise serene and peaceful sky, he seems to say, uh, he, he writes at the bottom, exterminate all the brutes, okay? All the brutes here simply means anyone who would stand in Kurtz's way from doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, Kurtz's idealistic evaluation of human life as something that is inherently valuable, uh, 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 his belief, uh, whether consciously held or unconsciously affirmed, as most of us do, okay, what most human beings believe to a certain extent that other human beings have basic rights, all right? Uh, when your brother or your sister is watching the TV show uh, uh, that you don't want to watch, you don't like kill them, uh, take the remote and change the channel. Okay, you might argue with them, you might donk them on the head. All right, uh, uh, it, de de it depending on how violent a person you are, uh, but you certainly don't just off them right then and there because they've stood in your way. Here, Kurtz is simply articulating the fact that your uh, it, the, the fact that you don't do that and the fact that we don't do that collectively in civilization is simply. All right, uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 this kind of belief that is a sentimental pretense is not based in anything true. It's not based in anything revealed to us uh, 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 in our environment. Ultimately, the only thing that our environment uh, uh, offers to us is that the strong survive, and that you have been made simply to survive. All right, at whatever cost. Okay, so suppressing savage customs, uh, to heck with that, right? <laughs> it, it Rather, uh, Kurtz has embraced a kind of savage custom. You stand in my way, I kill you, right? Uh, it's very simple, okay? Uh, so all of this, right, uh, 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 is, is articulated for us uh, in this um, description of Kurtz in which Kurtz becomes... Uh, the uh, 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 something very different than Marlowe uh, hoped that he would be. Okay, now um, it's interesting because Kurtz is described by Marlowe as being uh, uh, sort of loved by the jungle, caressed uh, uh, in intimate 
uh, acquaintance with uh, the natural world, with the Congo, with the hidden truths, all right, that ultimately there are no metaphysical uh, uh, moral orders uh, uh, for that, that govern the human life, but rather human, human beings are free to pursue power and pleasure uh, however they want to, right? That this fact, not all, that, that his uh, sort of immersion in this environment, uh, uh, it, it, it does two things to him. Ready? Watch. It blesses him, all right? The, 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 the personified Congo, Marlowe personifies the Congo as, as something that is spoiling him, pampering him, giving him worshipers as Kurtz is worshipped as a god. All right, blessing him with all the ivory, all the material wealth that he could ever want, but also simultaneously, as it blesses him as, it, as its favored son, it also gets into his veins and consumes his flesh. It makes him ill. It's killing him even as, as it is blessing him. Why is that, right? Why uh, uh, is the war, why, why is uh, uh, Kurtz's relationship with the natural environment described in this paradoxical way? Well, because to embrace a world that, listen carefully, okay, and I'm going to try to say this as clearly as possible, uh, but what Marlowe is recognizing is that to embrace a world that is governed solely by power dynamics and the pursuit of pleasure at any cost, to embrace the ethic of the food chain, Okay, and, and abject carnal materialism, very similar to, say, the worldview of the wife of Beth, right, is also to affirm, all right, it, it is also to say at the same time that there is no lasting significance to one's life beyond death. There is no God, no judgment, and no afterlife in which justice will be done, no crowns for the righteous, and law-abiding, no destruction for the unrighteous and the lawless. There's no immortal soul. Let me say that again. There's no immortal soul, only the mortal flesh. Mortal means dying, which is from the moment of birth, okay, from the moment you pop out uh, of your mom, cursed by the inevitability of death without exception, and without resurrection. So to embrace a purely material world is to also embrace the all-consuming power of death as all living things, not just human beings, but all living things, and, uh, and verily, all elements of our entire environment. Everything in our universe is moving toward entropy and annihilation even as we bitterly attempt to survive, okay? So in that, uh, uh, so, so Kurt's body reflects that paradoxical reality as he embraces the truth that is hidden in the natural world, that there is no moral order, there is no such thing as the morally coherent life, okay? But also simultaneously as he embraces that, all right, it consumes his flesh because to embrace that is also to affirm the reality that there is no immortal, immortal soul. There is no such thing as eternity or eternal life. Everything is moving toward annihilation. In this sense, the only God that there is is the God of death, the God of destruction. Uh, and death is no God at all, right? It's not an entity that is in control. All right, it is just an entity that will overpower all living things uh, as the universe itself moves towards annihilation, entropy, disorder, uh, and chaos. Okay? So, in this sense, right, Kurtz uh, becomes a, a kind of uh, a, a, a paragon, not of the moral idealism that Marlowe is looking for. Kurtz is a lawless man. He is conventionally a wicked man. But, all right, he is an honest man. He is an authentic man. Though he is wicked, though he is traditionally or conventionally uh, lawless, Kurtz's ethical system is cogent. It's logical. 
And in this way, Kurtz is not the idealistic me uh, messianic figure that Marlowe hoped he would be, but rather a, kind, a, a different kind of incarnation, an incarnation of the god of death, an incarnation of a purely material, purely carnal world. And that is a disturbing truth. And that is a truth that Marlowe and all of the other characters in part three are going to have to learn to live with in light of the disturbing reality discovered in Marlowe's distinctly modern pilgrimage. Have a great day.